Um, my name is Cloda Jenkins. I'm a professorial teaching fellow in Imperial College London and associate director for the Centre for Teaching and Learning Economics. And as one of the three hosts, myself, Pram and Doug McGee from Cornell, um, we're delighted to welcome you to our third virtual conference, Teachy Conference. Um, we're really excited that we've been able to keep this going, that it didn't end up just being a one-off COVID event. Um, I'd like to start just by thanking all the people who contributed to our asynchronous part of the conference last week. We had a lot of fun on YouTube. Um, so thank you to everyone who joined us there. And all those videos are available on YouTube if anyone wants to dip into them at any point. We've also had great registration for the live session. So we're looking forward to meeting everyone through the webinar. So it is a webinar and um, it is recorded. But obviously the only people who are seen on it are the people presenting um, and the recordings will be put up onto YouTube after the conference. Um, it's not being streamed, it'll just be recordings on there. We are looking forward to meeting people more um, personally in the mixer sessions at the end of each day. So today we have a mixer session sponsored by Ed, um, which starts in three hours time. So anyone who can stay for that session, it's the best opportunity to sort of um, try and replicate some form of networking off the back with the presenters and the organisers and all the other attendees. Um, we will get started with our session in a second. I just wanted to say hi and we're thinking of you to all the people who couldn't participate with us last week and this week. We had one asynchronous presenter who's been affected badly by the um, war in Ukraine and I'm sure there are many other people who aren't able to join us. So just a message from CTEL and from Doug that we hope the situation gets better and that we can meet soon. But in the meantime, please do join us on YouTube if and when you can find the time. So on that note, um, welcome to our panel on what we branded a long time ago, something very vague called current issues in economics teaching, knowing that come June 2022, we'd have a clearer idea of what the current issues were. And what the panel and I have worked on is a theme around diversifying resources to reach different audiences. So the session after this is around diversifying economics teaching. Um, so hopefully you'll find the two very complimentary. But our three panelists who really nicely represent the global nature of Teachy Conference. So we are spanning the globe this afternoon. Um, I think morning, noon and night covered here. Um, so we're going to cover what they have worked on in terms of diversifying resources. Um, we have some questions prepared. But please do use the Q&A area um, on the webinar to ask your questions for the panellists. You can also upvote other people's questions so that I can see which ones are most popular. You can, of course, use the chat, and I can see many of you are, um, just to say hi, but to have your own chats. Um, but we're going to focus on the Q&A for the um, formal questions to the panel. So without further ado, I'm going to start by asking each of our panelists to do a very short presentation on what they've done to diversify resources in economics teaching. And as part of that, they're going to introduce themselves. And um, we're going to get started with Jadrian. Make sure I unmuted myself. Uh, so good. I'm going to say good morning because I'm in, I'm in Pennsylvania. So it's, it's morning for me. Um, but I, it's always amazing just seeing all the places that everybody's from. And it's so great that everybody was able to make it out. Uh, so I am an associate teaching professor currently uh, at Penn State University. So I have uh, three more days and then uh, I'll be a collegiate professor at Virginia Tech next year. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave Penn State on there for now. I was asked uh, as a Penn Stater. Um, in terms of diversifying resources, I have uh, spent the past couple years uh, just doing probably too much, um, but thankfully I'll be able to share some of the stuff that, uh, that I've been doing. Um, I wanted to start by actually just providing uh, a little motivation. I, I mean, you're you're either up late, up early, or you're you've chosen to spend your Monday with us. So I, I don't think this is too much of a motivation. Um, but every time I try to start one of these talks, I try to go back to uh, to this because it's a good reminder for me too. Uh, we're all very passionate about a lot of different things, uh, and I found this in a book one time when I was reading about how to share your research and how to share the stuff you're working on. 
Uh, and it always stands out and it's always a nice vivid reminder of uh, teach what you know. Uh, and we know a lot more than economics. Uh, I saw Doug's background of like working stuff. So I think I'm gonna ask him questions about that later. Um, there's a lot of things you know that are not just economics. And so a lot of what I've done and what I've realized I've done over the past couple of years is bringing in things that I realized I knew that I didn't think was like that important. And then as I've worked on it, I've realized it's become really important for a lot of people. Uh, so I write a weekly newsletter. That was one of the things I started actually during the pandemic uh, in terms of diversifying kind of what resources are out there. Uh, I was talking to a lot of my uh, high school educators, secondary educators, and they said, you know, we don't really have a lot of really good content that we can share with our students. And I was like, well, I, I like to see news and find current events and trending topics. Uh, and so I started this as kind of a fun distraction away from uh, the pandemic, and then it kind of built a little bit. And then a, a lot of my high school educator friends were just like, these are great. I give these to my students. It's a, it's a quick explain explainer of different things. Uh, and so I was working on it actually before this. So it'll come out Monday afternoon today. Um, so if you're subscribed, you'll get one and it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, but I realized that like what I was working on before in terms of resources were very targeted towards American audiences, people who taught like me, um, and people who were teaching at college level. And I realized there was a whole host of other people who needed other resources, um, that just either weren't getting it or weren't being included in the conversations. Uh, and so, at least for my newsletter, when I write it, and there's there's other newsletters out there um, that are targeting different people at different levels. Um, I I just really like learning stuff, so I write about just some of the weirdest stuff every single week. So these are just five of them from last week or last year, um, but it's everything. And sometimes you can kind of tell maybe by the topic uh, what the actual like economic content is. So it's things from like common resources to the Nobel Prize, one's about incentives, one's about monopsonies. And so what I wanted to try to do is uh, help high school educators really um, explain the news to their students. And I think that this was a good way to do that. So this is a recent project I've started. Um, most of you maybe are familiar with my economics media library. This is the one that kind of has ballooned into a massive thing. Uh, it's got video clips from television shows, movies, commercials, stand-up. There's like 600 videos on the website. Uh, if you've never seen it, you can lose hours playing with everything on there. Um, but this was part of that diversity of resources. It started as my way of helping my students, and it's kind of ballooned into helping a bunch of students. Um, they're all kind of set up with a small clip, a description. People send stuff in, and so it's a really great common resource. If you have great media clips, please share them with me. Um, this is probably what I think I've, I've been doing this for years now. This is probably what I'm most known for. And then last year, maybe two years ago, uh, we realized that almost all the clips on this website were from U.S. sources, U.S. movies, U.S. TV shows. Um, and we didn't really have a lot of international pop culture. We have lots of international students. Uh, economics is clearly taught in other countries. And we said, well, why, why are all of our resources uh, English-based and really based out of the United States? Uh, so... I joined a couple co-authors. You're going to see Wayne's name pop up here on a lot. So Wayne, I don't think is super surprising that he's on these on these uh, on these titles. Uh, we came together and we started to put international uh, resources together. So whether you're in an English speaking country, whether you're in a foreign country, uh, you can also use pop culture in your classroom. And those have turned into really cool publications that have like actual hands on teaching demonstrations. So whether it's microeconomics, just grabbing clips from around the globe. Uh, I know this is Promise favorite uh, is using K-pop uh, in the classroom. So we've talked about different ways that you can use K-pop songs, uh, whether it's principal stuff, whether it's behavioral, game theory, indifference curves, upper level, lower level, all sorts of stuff. Uh, Wayne and I have uh, found a partnership that I think has worked really well. Uh, Wayne was part of the asynchronous session uh, and talked about our use of Squid Game, and that's the one that we're working on now, too. Uh, so if you like Squid Game or if, uh, we have a website set up for it uh, that you can go in and, and and grab video clips for your classroom. We try to cut out a lot of the violence uh, when we could, um, but just trying to find resources that other people could use that uh, was just a lot of fun. Um, and it kind of all centers back to this idea that like, I like media, I like pop culture in the classroom. I like showing economics to other people. Uh, that's what I feel like I know. Uh, and as a result, like I think it's diversified our resources tremendously. So thank you for this uh, for letting me be part of this session. I'm excited to hear everybody else's uh, conversation as well. Fantastic, thanks, Adrian. And I'm going to hand over to Annika now to introduce herself and explain why she's here.
Okay, hopefully that works. Shout at me if not. Yeah, um, okay. Awesome, thanks, Claire. Um, so, hello, uh, my name is Annika. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Bristol, um, and I'm going to talk about some of the big content and structural changes that we made to the first year curriculum. Um, actually, back in 20, uh, the academic year 2021. Um, and when I say we, I really do mean we, because this was by no means me alone. There was a big team behind this project, um, including Christian Spielman, Sarah Smith, who did a lot of the structural changes, um, Daniel Gietzo and Baba Somek, who, who did a lot of the actual content, um, uh, certainly the majority of the content design. Okay, so um, what did we do? And most importantly, why? Hopefully this works. Um, well, first let me start with the why and in, in a way, I could say that the really short explanation of why is, well, because it was the year 2020. Um, we were really conscious of, of how turbulent this year was, um, particularly for young adults. Um, there was an awful lot going on. Um, even before COVID-19 really sort of started to affect their daily lives, there was a sort of a lot of anxiety, there was a lot of protests, and that was a demand for change surrounding climate change. Um, Greta Thunberg was even actually joining the school strikes in Bristol at the time. Then COVID-19 happened, um, it certainly started to hit the UK at that time, uh, fundamentally changing the ways our students were conducting their lives, their social interaction was limited, um, and they certainly felt like their opportunities were being limited. And then in June 2020, when we had protests around the world um, after the filmed murder of George Floyd whilst he was being arrested, um, the city of Bristol itself suddenly found um, that it was headline news because protesters in Bristol had pulled down the statue of um, this is Edward Colston and thrown it into the harbour. Um, for those unfamiliar with Edward Colston, his, his legacy had kind of been at the, the centre of a really heated public debate in Bristol um, about Bristol's involvement in the transatlantic traffic of, ensla of enslaved Africans um, for many decades. Um, and here, I think just as in many other parts of the world, there began or reignited a fierce debate about racial and class inequality the past, the present, and who's remembered in public spaces. And we were, we were really conscious that this was the environment our students were coming from and into. Um, and we were very conscious that amongst all this, they were kind of just expected to start at university and start an economics programme. Um, and, and suddenly just talking about things like price elasticity of demand and markups and so on, didn't really feel like the right way to go. Um, we, we know very well from open days and talking to our students that what drives a lot of them to study economics is the big questions, big questions about climate change and inequality. Um, but the, the way we had things set up didn't really seem to address that. I mean, we use the core curriculum, so things like inequality are at the start, um, but it didn't really feel like there was a space for student exploration of those topics in the amount that we would want. So we wanted to make sure we created some of that space for them to sort of really consider what economics does and in some case what economics doesn't do um, and what economics might have to say about some of these topics. Um, and so here's how we did that. Um, we had a series of three six week projects um, and these took place throughout the year um, and they had quite a lot of class time attached. There was, there was a weekly one hour class um, a class at the time was about 20 students um, and students would work in groups to produce some some kind of output depending on what the project was and the idea was that it was quite synoptic so they would draw on all the skills from all the units that they were taking um, and you might wonder how we found the time to do this um, and I'm going to say that, that that sort of accounting magic was done by thinking very carefully about how we used the hours that were allocated for personal tutoring um, so there's three projects that they did, um, you can see on the right there, each had a very different focus, so project one, for example, was an extension of something we've done for a long time, which is the first year video project, um, we've run that for, for several years, and we asked them to focus on reporting in a five minute video on an aspect of inequality in Bristol, um, and how that 
inequality has changed in Bristol, um, either looking from very far in the past to the modern day, or really focusing on policies that have been implemented in the modern day. And the other projects were on climate change and COVID-19, but looking at the global south, um, these are some of the outputs you can see that they generated here. Okay. So yeah, as I say, the, the idea was really that, that no project was too directed. Um, we really wanted to allow students to sort of explore and take ownership of the task in, in, as best as they could. Um, but with a lot of weekly supervised support so that those, those discussions could really be guided. I'll stop there. These guys are good. As soon as I wave my glasses, case they stop me. Um, finally, I'll pass to Arjun to introduce himself and his topic. Um, I, for some reason, it seemed to be the, the share screen seems to be disabled for me. So I'm not sure exactly what, what, what's, what's happening. That. Oh, you can try now. Okay. Let's try. Yep. Thanks. Okay. All right. Uh, so thanks everyone. And thanks for inviting me to this. Uh, my name is Arjun Jayadev and um, I'm a professor of economics at Azim Premji University in Bangalore, India. <laughs> and I'm also part of the uh, group of authors of the core curriculum, which Anika just mentioned. Um, I'm going to assume that most people know something about the core curriculum, but um, just as a sort of uh, crazy, it's this um, sort of collective of economists who produce material, um, which hopefully sort of brings the more interesting topics of economics up to the front of the book and uses the best modern available tools to try to teach those. In, in some sense, it's really attempt, attempting a paradigm shift in teaching. I was involved with this group, uh, um, you know, from 2013, 2014, when it was nascent. Uh, but my interest you know, to have teaching in India has always been to try to make sure that economics speaks to the context uh, in which we are. And uh, one of the problems, if you will, of, uh, uh, of economics teaching globally, and I, know, I noticed a lot of people from all over the world on this conference is that um, in some sense, even if you have something like uh, the core curriculum, which purports to be about the economy, um, the economy that's usually in front of people, however hard you try, is the economy of um, uh, the globalized north, right? Uh, an economy which looks, uh, you know, much more like the globalized north economy, the single sector economy and so on. Um, what I wanted to do and what a group of us really wanted to do was to try to use the best of this, but also adapt it to the South Asian context. Um, and the idea was sort of twofold. Uh, it's really easy to use examples and data from different countries, but that doesn't get to the kind of deeper question that you want to do, which is to say, when the student looks out of the window uh, and then looks at their textbook, are they seeing the same sort of economy? Are they, uh, does it really reflect their experience as it were? Right? And so that is a much harder task because there are certain things that you have to get in there which are not immediately kind of the central questions that may be there for, uh, let's say developed country context, right? So, what the kind of uh, kind of topics I'm talking about? Dualism, economic dualism, the fact that you have two sorts of economies right outside your window: uh, a more modern, uh, urbanized economy and an agrarian economy, a surplus economy, and that's literally outside your window. Um, people who are in the informal sector and people who are in the formal sector. That's one set of things that students ought to be aware of right from the outset, and it shouldn't be something that they get any insight into only in their third year development economics course, if they get there at all. Uh, so that was one of the desiderata. And the second was, uh, you know, an example, um, when we talk about women's uh, labor force participation, um, the kind of motivation, the kind of debates that are there in the West may be distinct from the ones that are there in India, or the kind of things which actually motivate these. Um, how can we teach things like that? Other issues which um, one could quite easily sort of identify if you're from uh, North India, you don't have to uh, look very far, you look out of your window to see externalities wafting along, you know, the, the, in, the, in the winters with, with crop burning pollution levels, go, it's very, very high. But for some reason, we don't take that to be a kind of central way to teach things like externalities. So I think was to, to, to really make this an, uh, uh, 
a book, in fact, and, and the book is out, it's part of the, the suite of the core curriculum, it's called Core South Asia, which has these themes, concepts all inbuilt, so that when a student is reading their textbook, it's not so much of an ask to actually make them uh, understand that that's the economy you're looking at. So I'll just walk through a couple of examples, right? The first chapter in core speaks about the capitalist revolution, and it's really sort of from the British perspective, you talk about how there's been this massive change in the last 200 years um, uh, in terms of things like uh, industrialization or growth in income and so on. Um, the way that we adapted this was to talk about the non-agricultural share of the labor force, right, which is another way of looking at industrialization. And all countries seem to follow that pattern, uh, the graph on the left, um, but it seems like the, the, that transition is much more complete in Europe. So what's the missing link in this story? One missing link that one could talk about is colonialism, which of course, if you're from India and you've been taught in India, that's a sort of very central thing that you learn first, but it's not at all foregrounded uh, in, in uh, a Western textbook. Right? So immediately, right from the outset, you get a sense that these are actually distinct, uh, distinct actually development patterns and they're interlinked linked in, cons in sort of complex ways, right? That's one example of things that we've, uh, we've kind of created uh, with the textbook. Here's another, uh, which is an extremely strange thing, which you don't see in, in other countries in, in pictures, but in India you have, which is over the last 15 years, a, a decline in women's labor force participation. Uh, and it's hard to actually see this, but you'll see that the red line, which is uh, rural India in 2004, 2005 versus 2016, 17, you'll see far fewer women um, participated at all age levels uh, in, in, uh, in work. It's an important kind of social question in India. What the what are the impediments? Is it just an income and and uh, substitu substitution uh, story, effect story, or is it more about very very complicated sociological factors? And we can talk about that in a much more effective way and teach income and substitution effects in a way that's actually much more meaningful to the for the students. Uh, here's a third example. And this one I'm particularly proud of, which I, I didn't think that we I'd actually be able to do, but I was able to actually create which is uh, really the notion of a dual economy. And if you start off with uh, a feasible production fr frontier and you have surplus labor, which is, uh, which is what we're talking about, you actually see that people can move from the factory to the farm. I see, I see you, I'll, 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 I'm done in one, one minute, right? So, if, so from the, from the fa farm to the factory, and you can actually have a nice model of that, uh, Lewis model. And then there are stories which you actually have Indian firms being actually central. So for example, the story of, how AIDS drugs were actually uh, became much cheaper because of, of, of a company, Sipla, which went in and broke monopolies. And so Indian companies and real companies become part of an international story as well. There are other stories, I want other examples and things that make it more important. For instance, I won't go into that, demonetization, uh, pollution, all of the kind of things which matter for the Indian context, macro data. So if you want to check it out, you can take a look at the course of Asia. Thanks. Thanks, Arjun. Um, so we're getting some good questions coming in on the Q&A. One of the things that I would say from hearing all three of you is that we've sort of got different ways of creating resources, if that makes sense. So Jadrian's kind of crowdsourcing sources um, from things that already exist to a large extent. Annika, you were obviously creating projects and getting students to create resources. And Arjun, you've obviously gone to kind of the most developed thing, which is actually creating a whole textbook um, for a particular audience. And I wonder if, um, Jadrian, I might start with you, sort of how you go about finding the resources. And Sylvia so had the question about how you make sure you get copyright for your media library and that side of, side of things. Um, and Annika and Arjun, I'll have sort of a similar question for you in a minute. So I, when I first started doing it, I would say that I was finding a lot of it myself. I was watching a lot of TV, movies, and then I would just find the clips themselves. Um, at a certain point, I kind of stopped. I haven't really watched a lot of TV and movies lately, so I've kind of stopped doing that. And other people have started to just contribute. So a lot of times it's um, it's other, other economists sending stuff in. I used to have it where students would find stuff um, as like part of a project, but I, I think it, it grew to a, a point that other people have found it and, and found it helpful. Um, for like the newsletter, it's really just each week, just kind of seeing what's happening. Um, and if there's a topic that really stands out, um, I really like that. And I try to find some sort of principles type concept. 
Uh, so like the one that's coming out this afternoon is about uh, comparative advantage and homelessness. And so it's just any sort of news story, there's probably some kind of core principle on underlying it. Um, and so I try to find those sorts of things. And a lot of it is is me finding it. Um, but like you said, it's uh, so I would say me finding it and then crowdsourcing where other people are coming and saying like, this is a really good idea too. Um, in terms of like the copyright stuff, uh, a lot of that is handled by, um, so I use Critical Commons for all of the videos uh, and they handle a lot of like the necessary components in order to um, use the media for educational purposes. Uh, and so they kind of, they kind of handle a lot of that stuff. Well, thank you. And Arjun, obviously what you're doing is a huge exercise. How do you go about finding your examples and that type of thing? And also there was a question from Doug about do things need to be in English or in other languages or is there anything that you had to think about on that front? That's, that's it. Uh, well, for the first part, I think that I tried many different things when, when actually it's, it's not that uh, I said, you know, got, for example, um, that would be women's labor force participation. That was the example that I would use. We tried many different sorts of things. I just, I guess it's because there are certain things in the Indian economy that we really want to foreground. Um, and we I tried very hard to see how they could actually uh, dovetail as it were with, with the core curriculum. What was really hard actually, and I didn't realize it, and which is why it took me so long to actually do this was, um, it's very hard to do, to change an existing textbook and put in things without making it either too long. Um, it's, you know, for everything that you put in, you need to take something out. And that can be extremely difficult because of the interdependencies. And um, I have to say, I was very grateful to people like Wendy and Sam and Margaret, who spent a lot of time actually telling me how I was wrong about very, very many things. So I had to re rework that. Um, the question on languages, yes. So um, there is an active translation project um and that is um uh going on for for both hindi and urdu there's one in Kannada, which is the local language where i am and um if we have at least in the university a, a bunch of people who are interested in creating different language uh, versions so so yeah so um uh, that's still to be seen how that 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 will work out and what kind of resources we can get that. but that's part of the, the adventure at the moment i think Google Translate can only get us so far, Doug, as we've discovered, um, and doing that. Annika, so in terms of creating new resources, what kind of advice do you give to students about creating their resources? So a lot of these things come up in terms of, um, you know, the copyright things and all that kind of thing as well, um, but also how you came up with resources to advise them on what to do or to, to define the projects and that side of things. Yeah, I guess there's two sides of it. One is that I spent a lot of time, I think when I first arrived at Bristol, writing guidance on copyright for students and how to use it and how to think about it because they don't. And I don't think they're so used to doing it from school. So I think we have a standard document now that you use every year and update as needed, but on how to use different types of things, whether it's videos or, or graphs or, or so on um, from different sources. Um, I think one of the, the resources I really, really like to use with them, um, and often the good pieces of work do, is that, I mean, first of all, the UK is really lucky in the fact that it has a lot of good, freely available data that they can use to create their own stuff about the place. But Bristol in particular <laughs> is really open with its, its local council data and by region and, and uh, by region of the city, I mean, um, and it, it's a resource that I feel we almost don't make enough of. And I, I think, you know, when, when students come to Bristol, it's often not an area of the UK they've necessarily known a ton about. And so making use of those local resources as much as possible to help them learn about the place they've landed in um, is, is something I'm just really keen on doing. So whatever form our projects take in the first year, that, that first year data, will, that, that, that local council data will, will feature at some point because it's pretty rich. Yeah, I really like both you and Arjun um, that approach of what's available locally. I mean, I remember going back, you know, sort of primary school age, you do a local project in your local area, but somehow by the time you get to university, you sort of forget that, I think. Um, I'm going to stick with you, Annika, because there's a question, well, there's two questions in the chat around the sort of logistics of your project. Um, one is around whether the students get feedback on some sort of draft 
before they submit. Um, and I guess I'll just add in the does it count question because that's always a good one to ask. And then a second question from people wondering, um, Carlos in particular, but he's had a lot of likes around what do you mean by lots of weekly support? I know you made the reference to personal tutoring as well um, and the kind of about the support and resources they need to do it well. Sure. So um, I mean, it helps if I describe how it actually took place. So the idea certainly at the beginning of the year was that there would be a weekly class, so an hour in a classroom, um, and each class would have between three and four groups working on three to four projects within it. Um, and that hour, so you, you'd spend, when you first start the project, I might spend half the class presenting it and, you know, here's what we want you to do and the types of things you need to look at and here are the stages you might need to go through to reach the output you need. Um, but then classes after that would all be like, okay, so by the end of this class, I want you to tell me what you're going to do by the time you come back next week. And then when you'd come back next week, we'd spend a good 15 to 20 minutes discussing each person's, each, each group's project. Um, sometimes in an isolated group while everybody's talking, or sometimes we'd share that as a group together. So to me, that feels like lots of feedback, getting a sort of weekly checkup on how you're doing um, and being able to talk through any problems that you're having, problems like copyright or where do I find the data or how do I present this? Um, so I think they would get, I think that kind of weekly feedback was actually far more, val far more important than the final feedback they got. Um, but each group project did get proper written feedback at the end as well, um, on what they'd done well, what they would need to consider for the future. Um, the work itself didn't directly count. They were required to participate in and submit uh, a project as part of a group. And there, there was a, we, we had a form where students could fill in to sort of say how they felt they contributed to the group and if there were any big issues that, that arose that might need us to check out was somebody completely free riding. Um, the way I guess we really incentivized it though was not through that method but by the fact that the assessments which did count on the course required very similar skills so they very closely mirrored that so there was absolutely every incentive to try and engage with that. I used to say to them get all your mistakes out of your system in this project and then your final piece of work will be better. That, that's how it worked. Very good, thank you. And um, Arjun, in a sort of similar vein, but maybe a bit more big picture, what kind of challenges did you find making your materials more authentic um, and sort of things that students wanted to sit down and read? As I mentioned, was really trying to get something that um, the dovetails with the larger project. I think that was for me the biggest challenge because um, in some sense there are distinct economies and different distinct things that people want to foreground. Um, to be honest, I didn't find any difficulty. One, one thing that I've been very grateful about was that once I started teaching about this, it didn't feel unnatural to the students at all. They were just learning about whatever it is they were learning about and just so happened the concepts came along with that, which is what I was really aiming to do. Um, so I think the, the, the sort of the, the, the biggest challenge is to, to try to actually conceive of something um, where this, where the Indian economy, whichever economy you think of, is not an afterthought or not a pathology. And that, that actually is something that's so, ingrained. pathology is too strong a word, but, you know, not the a, a, a sort of um, departure from the, the norm, and it's not a departure from the norm. It is it is what the economy has always been, you know, dual economy and so on. So um, that challenge to try to always foreground, you know, what is being seen and what the students actually will see, that was actually harder than I thought. It, it took it took much more effort for me, and that's I guess part of the training of economics. You know, it's um, much probably much less so in other social sciences where certain things are uh, considered fine from the local area, but um, but in, in economics, if you will, there's early imperialism of, of, uh, of economics and it doesn't seem natural anymore to, to talk about uh, say the Indian experience except as a, as a development economics course. I think that was the biggest challenge. And would they have done any economics before or this is their first? This is yeah. their first, yeah. this, is a, this is their first time. And so uh, they, by the time they're in the end of the first year, they're much more informed about the structure of the Indian economy than most other students. And, they're not, they're not just looking at, say, 
an increment substitution effect, you know, in abstract or yeah. you know, thinking about ice creams versus whatever it is. But also have no preconceptions. So one of the yes, issues because they come with the I may have done yeah. some school. I, I think also, and I should say it also treats them, they don't realize, but I think it comes uh, sort of implicitly that they treat it with more respect as a result, right? That they're co-equal uh, investigators of the world around them. And that really is very, very powerful. Excellent. Um, so, Jadrian, a challenge is time. Um, and there's a question in the Q&A. Oh, Claudia, you uh, muted yourself. There. Okay. Um, <laughs> Preempting your you answering. So, yeah, the challenge of, I mean, my question is, how do you have time on a Monday morning to write a whole newsletter? But even just thinking about a course, um, you know, do you leave things out? What do you, how do you manage all of that? Um, so for the newsletter, I, I, most of it's coming from the from the week before. So uh, during the semester, I I write it like on Sunday nights, or at least get a head start on it on Sunday nights, thinking about like what I want to do, what topic I want to do. Um, the more I do it, the better I get at it. So it's there's kind of a pattern to each one, and uh, it kind of goes relatively quick. Um, in terms of like the course side of things. It, yeah, it's exactly what Arjun said earlier, right? Like whatever you put in, you have to take something out. Um, and so every time it's thinking about, you know, do I want to do this video clip? Do I want to do this example? Um, I go back through and I look at what I've already done and I'm, I try to figure out what isn't working well. Uh, so I am kind of a meticulous tinkerer when it comes to my principal's class. So I've taught it for years, but um, I still go through and I kind of, I print the slides and I'm like, okay, I got to this point, but this I need to get rid of. This didn't go well. Um, and that's that's where a lot of it comes in is if, if I feel like a video clip that I've used is getting too old or the reference isn't working or I don't feel like I'm it's it's doing what it's supposed to, then I go back and I kind of revise it. Um, so that's where a lot of it is. It's not just kind of piling and more and more each time. It, it really is kind of careful taking stuff out, putting stuff back in. I've realized a lot of it, especially with the pandemic, that there's a lot of things they can do at home on their own. Uh, so a lot of, I started to do more pre-class related stuff where I said, you know, I need you to watch this video clip before, because I was spending a lot of time in class explaining something that I think they could have done with a video explanation much faster. Um, so that's really been a lot of help too. Yeah, I think that's something a lot of us have discovered, this sort of, you can watch this video of me deriving something and talk about it later. And yeah. um, Annika, the other challenge which has come up in some of the questions is around scale. So how many students you have and how many instructors you have and how you manage that? I love the scale question because I used to say my classes are really big until I went to the C tree conference recently and realised they're tiny. But um, <laughs> no, um, so the year I'm talking about was about 500 students in total, technically taught across two units, but they were they were practically identical. Um, so that was a team of about 13 to 14 tutors. Um, it's quite resource intensive in that sense um i think particularly during that that year you know was the first fully covid impacted year and i it felt right to give students a lot of time with support it, just time to talk almost was, was a really really important part of support for them that year i think um and it did start face to face but we only had about 6 weeks before the government rules changed and we had to go fully online which actually was was easier in some sense because having group discussions about sensitive topics through masks shouted across a room just doesn't quite work um yeah so you know it it, it felt large to me um certainly at the time but um yeah, we, we haven't been able to keep up that level of resource in the same way. And I think now because students are back in the classroom more, they don't need quite that same level of intense support in that way. But the elements of it that we've tried to keep are things like having the same group together for an entire year's worth of teaching, um, having a couple of hours together every week with the same tutor so that you really form those, those relationships still. Um, and although we've kept aspects of the projects, they, they haven't remained just as big projects. We, we still got the video project in there as well. I guess we've kind of tried to adapt it to, yeah, what the students' needs are at this point in time. Um, yeah. And do they appreciate that? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> or more. Have you had good feedback on the project? <laughs> Yeah, no, the feedback's increased every year um, in terms of score. So, you know, that, that's good. Um, I think a bit like Jackie, I, I, I will keep tinkering. <laughs> um, 
but I think tinkering certainly feels like the way forward to me. I think sometimes I have a habit of trying to want to like throw an entire course out and start again from scratch or something, particularly when you encounter something new. Um, but there's, there's such a lot of stuff I feel I've learned over the past few years trying to work with the students through these big problems, but there's, there's a lot of it I want to keep. Um, and I think in particular listening to, listening to what students want to talk about and giving them that space to talk about it, uh, I just think it's something I'm always going to try and keep in my course, yeah. whatever form it takes. Very commendable. Um, Arjun, there's a few questions coming in from people who want to create lots of work for you. Um, but can I also, so there's questions about partnering up with other countries and I guess hopefully advising them on how they could do something similar. But also I think Doug's question about language and sorry, not language, about scale and um, was that from Doug? Yeah, it was. I think probably also applies here. So you'd only ever create a textbook if you thought it was going to be used by more than one class one year. Um, so maybe, you know, how it gets even used across India rather than just by you um, as well. Yeah, so there are actually parts of uh, the, core, the original core curriculum which are being used uh, in several places, some private universities, but also um, uh, in, for example, the University of Kerala, which uh, has whatever, 25,000 students, right? So um, the hope is that the South Asian version will replace the international version, um, but that takes a little bit of time. And so uh, these things, when they move, they move very quickly, but, uh, but they take a long time to move, right? So it, we, I'm trying various ways to actually get people interested in this. And I'm always happy uh, to, to um, to find people and talk with people about, uh, you know, doing this in other countries and trying and sharing my experiences with anyone who wants to do this. Great, thank you. So I think for the people in the chat, Sarah and Hernan and Amlan, if you're interested in finding out more about the core project generally, um, you can ask somebody that's not me. No, you can ask me or Arjun, um, or Arjun specifically on the um, Indian example. I think, um, so although it's in the chat, I'm not supposed to be looking at it, I can't resist the incentives topic. Um, so, Jadrian, what incentives does your institution give you to do this teaching in this kind of way? Which, which institution? <laughs> so uh, I'm guessing the one you're moving to. <laughs> I wouldn't like the to one I'm moving to is very supportive of, um, of, of, of things that are uh, engaging for students, that uh, making sure that students are um, finding value in their major, that they're learning stuff that they wanna learn. Like what Annika said, I think that's that's a lot of what I do for my upper level course. Um, they're very passionate and they have a lot of questions and making sure that you can answer those. Um, incentive wise, the incentives are to teach. Um, I mean, I get paid to teach. And so there's a, I would say there's a kind of a, a for some people, it's you do just enough, like a satisficing type approach. Um, but for me, it's more of a personal incentive. I really enjoy, I enjoy tinkering. Like I said earlier, I really like learning new stuff. Uh, and so for a lot of it is, is more personal for me. It's not necessarily financial or recognition. Jake or Arjun, any other incentives or is it all because that's what you want to do? Annika, sorry, mixing up my names. Annika, anything to add? It just changes a lot by institution, right? Um, and different institution administrations as well. I guess I'm pleased to see more institutions finding ways to recognize it. I hope they continue to do more of that. And I hope economists as a whole start to think about it. <laughs> but otherwise I completely agree with everything Adrian just said. I think we have, um... Oh, sorry, Arjun. Yes, you were muted, I think, when you started to answer. It's just a labor of love. So, I mean, they allow me to do whatever I want as long as it's on my, my time. <laughs> yeah, which is the middle of the night for this, obviously. Yes, so, um, yes no, I think, um, I think we're all in the same boat. So, in terms, another challenge, which um, I guess I'll throw at you, Jadrian, um, from Carlos and the Q&A is around keeping students motivated. So you can imagine 
something like Squid Games or the media is entertaining for a while and do they fall off in terms of their interests? Um, or do you make sure like that you, how do you make sure you keep them engaged through the whole term? Uh, so it's definitely, it's a, it's kind of like a buffet in class. I mean, there's, there's just so much, there's so many different things. Um, so what I have found is that, so I teach generally like a 50 minute class. Um, and so I, I may have a couple video clips at a time, maybe I'm trying to think of like an average day would maybe have like two or three. Um, but it's just kind of constant change throughout the whole thing. So we might talk for a little bit, stop, do some polling questions, watch a video, have a following follow-up polling question. Uh, but then like a, the next day might be completely different. It might be a little lecture, some sort of in-class activity, followed up with a video clip and then a polling question. So I like, I do a lot of polling questions. And so a lot of it is it's not one type of media the whole time. So it's not Squid Game the whole semester. Um, it really is just comp like I'm trying to think of all the different ones. It's everything from like I Love Lucy to Squid Game to all of a sudden there's a country music song. Like it's it's all sorts of stuff. Um, and I think that's really helped because when it pops up, they can see the preview of what the clip is going to be, but they generally have no idea what it's going to be. Like they don't know what the connection is going to be, what the story is going to be. Because for a lot of them, they, even if it's The Office, there's a handful of people who haven't seen The Office. And so for somebody, it's going to be new. For somebody who has seen The Office, they're going to see the clip, they know the scene, and then their next question, there's that like little curiosity, like, what does this have to do with economics? Where is he going with this? Um, and so I think it's kind of helped on both sides, whether it's something they've watched before or something they haven't watched. Um, that's really what kind of keeps them engaged is I've noticed that they, they just want to know what the application is. And do you, presumably being a nice US university, you assess through the term, so that helps people mm -hmm. engage through too as well. Yep. Is the assessment linked to the media stuff or is it more? It yeah, it depends. So it definitely depends on the clip. Um, so there's some small stakes assessments that happen, like the little clicker questions um, that are relatively small. In terms of like exams, I usually tell them that if it's a pop culture clip with an economics example, I'm going to ask about the economics, not about the pop culture. Uh, every now and then, so there's a longer video clip that I have um, that's kind of broken up into chunks. It's a, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's a, it's a news channel segment where they dropped a bunch of people in New York and they had to go find each other. Uh, and so it's in the game theory section of like common interests, common perceptions. Uh, but that's like 20 minutes long and it takes 30 minutes in class to do it because there's lots of polls and questions and like that. Uh, but on the exams, I would ask them about that one because it is a significant chunk of the course. Uh, so it really depends on kind of how it's used in class. Okay, so it's worth their while paying attention. Yeah. Um, Arjun, so certainly um, when I've taught from the May, the the economy, so the in, um, English slash American slash all other regions apart from India book, um, students do complain about the length of it and the workload. Um, and again, like Jadrin was saying, there's sort of an expectation that you come and you read it. Um, have you had any issues from students about workload? Yes, of course. <laughs> Nobody wants to I work. Mean, yeah, I mean, I think that's, uh, that's just standard. Um, I, you know, it's with any, you, you may know in the politics, with any textbook, there's a big kind of market for notes from the textbook, right? And note version of, of Cliff Notes versions. And uh, those make their way around and some people only use that. But one of the advantages or disadvantages of the core textbook is that you really can't get away with uh, just, you know, the examples change, the kind of uh, questions change, which makes it very hard to actually have that. So it's an ongoing problem. I mean, it is too much. We, we do teach, want to teach too much. It's too much to read. I, I mean, one thing that I'd be curious to hear from people is um, it's gotten worse over the last two years, uh, at least it seems that people are just not able to concentrate the way that they were able to concentrate, even to whatever extent they were able to concentrate before the pandemic. So I don't know how it will be. This year I'll retry it and see if the same complaints go or if I have to really kind of calibrate and, make, and basically teach less, you know, which might be, which might actually be a better outcome. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think we found that we have to kind of direct to me sections of a book or that kind of thing. So prioritize these bits if you're short of time or short of 
brain space, whatever it is that's causing it, but it's a good point. Um, Annika, how about you? Do you find that students do less on project three than project one or do they keep the momentum going? So with, with the projects, we actually found that so the three projects were quite different in the, you know, one was a lengthy report, one was a video and one was a data dashboard. And those require, I think, different skills um, and sort of that, that creates some interest from the outset. Um, so they don't feel like they're just doing the same thing again. Um, I actually think project three was probably the one they enjoyed the most. So um, but that, that, that's something I often find when, when, when you start the macroeconomics section of third year, you know, so, sometimes that's really what they feel they've come to be economics for, is, you know, uh, university economics for is to learn about inflation and unemployment and so on. And so if you start talking about those things, they, they get a bit more excited uh, at the start. Um, I so guess, oh, no, go on, go on. That top tip to put the interesting stuff at the end. So <laughs> draw them back. Uh, yeah, I, I try to have a really careful balance. So I, I think that there's two things I, I, I try to put in. Right? Uh, one is you need some novelty to keep the interest going. Um, and whether that's different assessment types, different videos or something different in the lectures, that, that's kind of one thing. But you have to balance that with the sense that students also like predictability quite a lot, right? So if you're going to have lots of novelty in, in things, then you have to keep things looking the same. And, you know, the three projects all had the same setup in terms of the brief and how to submit and how to work together and what was going to be expected of them. And the grading criteria were expressed in very similar ways. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, fundamentally, they, they did have to engage in something to pass the course. So, uh, you know, I guess that that was an incentive, an incentive. something that incentivizes them. Yeah. But they, they certainly do have fluctuations in their attention throughout the year, I think. Adrian, anything on Arjun's question about whether you think people's capacity to engage or the amount they can absorb has changed over time? I'm trying not to be cynical. I think the, right, the cynical answer is like, yeah, of course they can't do as much, but I think it depends. So it's right, it's, it's changing preferences for what how people want to learn stuff. Um, you know, I, I try to switch. I like to read, but I recognize, especially for a lot of 18 year olds, they don't like to, they don't want to read a book necessarily. Um, and so I, you know, I, I've tried to switch to podcasts, but then I found that, um, reading a podcast like as a digestion type to learn is, is much different than just listening casually. Uh, so I've, I've noticed that I've tried to do, and it just goes back to, I guess, Annika's point too, a lot more structure on my end uh, of saying, here's how you should do it. Like, I'm going to assign this podcast. Here's a resource for how to listen to podcasts from an educational standpoint. Um, you know, here's reading a chapter, but here's how to read a chapter for educational purposes. So I've, I've started to build in more of that structure. But at the same time, I think that kind of goes back to your question on the issue is that now there's more things in the course they need to do. It's no longer just listen to a podcast. It's listen to a podcast and read this blog about yeah. how to listen to a podcast. Um, and so I think the students who take that recommendation early on end up doing really well in the course because they realize that those resources are there for them. Um, what I've noticed is it's, it's lost a lot of people. Um, I, I think I've definitely... I've lost a chunk faster than I usually do because there's more stuff. Um, so I've started to use more of my resources and my time of like directly reaching out uh, either through emails of like, hey, you're falling behind early, early intervention type stuff. Uh, I've done a lot more of that. And I just realized it's a time shift. Instead of telling them how to listen to a podcast, I give them a link. And then I spend that time with the people who didn't look at the link. Yeah. Um, and that's been a lot of it. Yeah, I think the sort of, feedback before the feedback and the feedback after the feedback. It's, yeah, it's a lot more oh. feedback. Um, it, it's, they, they have other stuff they want to do. They're, they're just like us. Um, they're really not any different and they all have different preferences. Yeah, and they're all optimizers. We have to remember that, even if they're not very good at it. Um, Annika, there's a question for you from Doug about whether your projects are embedded in any way into the first year econ course and if so did you have to take material out of that or they're totally separate um but they were sort of standalone but um it probably wouldn't have appeared that way to the students because the tutor they had for that was the same as the tutor they had for their main economics principles course so it would have felt like it was attached um 
and the, the projects were kind of set with the skills in mind of what they'd have done in the units so far, so that they had that opportunity to bring it all together. Um, yeah, it, it did create some competition for time, um, because I think in a way it felt like an extra piece of work for them to complete, even though we'd kind of taken the summative, sorry, the, the formative you know, work that doesn't count out of the main unit and put it towards that time. Um, I think actually, if you have a lot of group, uh, yeah, I think everybody who's ever done a group project and of course knows this, but they, they take a lot of time to just work out how to work as a group and how to communicate and, and all these kinds of things. And even though Zoom's made it easier, um, that was taking a lot of their mental energy. I think at the beginning, it was actually nothing to do with the economics taking up their time. Just, it was just, how do I coordinate um, was taking yeah. up a lot of time. Not a bad skill in itself to learn, um, but I probably hadn't allowed for how much time that would take them. Yeah, I think Jonathan Boymel from Melbourne had a nice um, thing on LinkedIn today about how um, if you're going to do group work, you have to teach them how to work in a group somehow, um, which nobody's ever taught me how to work in a group. So, but anyone who works with me. Knows. Well, no, but for, for, for that reason, I think, you know, the, the other thing to keep in mind in I think with group work is you have to, it has to reappear later in the curriculum as well, right? There's yeah, no point exactly. teaching them to do it once or twice and then it, they never do it for the rest of their time. You know, I think if, if I had infinite resources, that'd probably be one of the things I would do is implement compulsory group projects in every year group, but I don't. Yeah, I know I'm teaching somewhere where they have that basically and there's so many complaints that now they're talking about getting rid of compulsory group projects. So there's no one way that works. I think. Um, and a shout out to Steffi for her. That's a really nice idea actually to have something around if you are running behind focus on this kind of ideas. Because I think Jadrian's right, the engaged who have time on their hands, and some students had a lot of time on their hands in 2020, 2021, um, at, you know, nice comfortable homes and they had time. Um, but other people are in a different position. So I have that conversation a lot in office hours with people around I'm just way behind should I drop out kind of thing and then you start talking about okay actually well what you can do is this this and this and you know catch up this way um I'm conscious that before we met I asked you a general question about what challenges you face creating these new resources is there anything that we haven't talked about that anyone wants to flag at this point on the challenges um, I'll add in just because I think Doug and I had a little side comment in the chat part. Um, I, one of the challenges I've had is overcoming myself uh, in the process of creating these things because I'm clear I'm an expert in the stuff that I'm doing. Um, and I found that the deeper I get into these things, I tend to forget that they don't know. And I think Annika mentioned it just like right at the end, like if there's group work, you have to teach them how to do group work. We go in assuming that they know how to do those things. Um, because it's just so natural to us. That's been one of the challenges that's been really tough for me to overcome. Um, and even just using media in the classroom, I realized that when I would introduce an international clip, so like even Squid Game is so popular, I would still take time to really kind of better describe the scenario, but I wasn't doing the same thing with like the US clips. Like, so the stuff from The Office or Parks and Rec, I would just say, oh, here's a scene, you know, I'd kind of give a very brief one. Uh, but recognizing that like, there's people who haven't seen both groups. Uh, or there's groups of people who haven't seen each show. Um, yeah. So kind of overcoming myself was a really big challenge. And I, I try to do a lot better job of just like recognizing that there's, I, I have gaps in that uh, knowledge area. Yeah, I did the same, assuming they knew how to find a reading on the reading list in the library and then discovered that they didn't. Um, Annika, any challenges that we haven't talked about that you wanted to flag? Yeah, um, so I, I think one thing, with the, with the list of topics we were looking at, I expected a lot more student complaints than we got. Um, and it, it kind of taught me to be really careful about how you ask the questions about current content and uh, you know, current events and making sure that the question is open enough that they can interpret it in a way that they feel they can engage with it. So to give you an example of something that went wrong, we, you know, we asked them a question about, um, well, how is COVID-19 um, affected education and what effects might we expect on economies as a result of that? Um, and I, I had a complaint from a student um, who really hated the fact that they were being asked to consider the fact that their earnings might be impacted or so on. And this is, you know, the <laughs> 
aren't they depressed already with everything that's going on and now I'm making them really think about how depressing it could, how much more depressing it could get. And that really wasn't my intention. My intention was to say, hey guys, look, this thing has happened here here's your chance to be empowered and say what do you want to happen you know what policies do you want to place to help you recover from this and make sure that you get the future that you're entitled to um but that really hadn't come across to them in the way that I phrased it and it was fine and you know we spoke to the student and we gave them alternatives and, and choices to deal with it and all that kind of thing but it, it did teach me a lot about how you really have to keep the questions open and give them ways out if they don't want to do the obvious thing you know we wrote this question with COVID-19 in mind but don't feel you have to talk about that. Here's some other things you could talk about if you want to. Um, I think that's was something I really, if you want the learning to be empowering, then you, I think you have to keep it open like that. Very good, thank you. Arjun, any challenges we haven't covered? Yeah, I think more or less really what uh, Anika and Jadrin have been going over, I think these are the same kind of issues. That's really what strikes me in listening to everyone is how roughly the same kind of problems we're facing and challenges we're facing, both, uh, you know, contextual or, you know, having to find different ways of finding engagement. Um, I didn't teach this last year uh, and I'll teach again this year. I'm, I'm kind of anxious because I'm hoping, um, and maybe it's not appropriate, for sort of a reset among the students, you know, that they can come in and learn with each other uh, together, you know, in a way that they were doing before. And I, what I, I re realized in this last year was how important it was for people to actually be with each other for the, that kind of learning to happen. Um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't imagine it was so central, but, uh, and I don't even know what it is that makes it more, uh, more easy for them to absorb kind of material and actually engage with the material, just being in, sitting together in a classroom as opposed to sitting together on screen. So um, that's, that's the big hope. I don't know what's going to happen you know, in another a uh, few months. I'm hoping for that reset to happen and to, to come together. Let's see. Let's see where we are. Yeah. yeah, no, I think we all underestimate that sort of whispering to the person beside you, what did he say? What does it mean? <laughs> or even, you know, walking out of the room and going for a coffee to talk about it. It's a huge thing. Um, I just had a question. So, oh, Adrian, Adrian, there's a question from Doug. Um, just so you know, the co-hosts on here can't post in the Q&A, which is why they're coming up separately. Um, how do you identify what's popular for students? So you've kind of said, you know, you're very much directed by what you enjoy. Have you tried crowdsourcing from them or this year's cohort for next year or anything like that? So I, I generally pick the things that I like. Um, that's a little part of that, like that image earlier, like the teach what you know, yeah. um, because I don't really watch a lot of TV and, and like, I don't watch Game of Thrones. Um, and I, I think this goes back a little bit in terms of just like developing authentic things. Um, even if they do like Game of Thrones and I found a clip that somebody had sent me, they will notice immediately if I stand up there and I try to explain it, like they're gonna know that I don't know what's like the backstory. Um, so, I, you know, I try to watch things that they, like I didn't watch Squid Games when it first came out. I just, I was like, yeah, it doesn't seem like something I would like. Uh, and then Wayne is actually the, the he, he prodded me uh, into doing it. And then I sat down and watched and I loved it. Um, and so I'm very careful about finding things that they like, but also that I am comfortable showing them and that I'm comfortable talking to them about it as well. Um, so that's a big portion of it. I don't show them anything that I haven't already watched or I don't know at least something about. Good point. And Arjun, can I just check? So Jadrin's just mentioned, obviously he works with Wayne, who's in Australia. Do you have co-authors who work with you as well? And I guess one of the things that can happen even with an online textbook is your examples go out of date or your, you know, the world changes around you. Do you have plans to update or how do you think you might do things like that? Tough question because it was so hard to get done um, the first time that I'm hoping that it'll last for another two years before people tell me that it's out, completely out of date. Or, um, I've had a group of people who've contributed, but with textbook writing specifically, um, it's it really suffers from the public goods problem, right? I mean, it, it, someone has to be responsible for every part of it, and it becomes much harder. You can't, you know, write an article or write, you know, a passage. And you, we tried this, you know, we tried asking, commissioning various things. It doesn't work, and so it was more or less something that I just held, and and so did the, you know, Wendy and Sam and and uh, Margaret in terms of evaluating. Um, so 
I think it's harder with something which is much more comprehensive to actually have uh, co-authors. And it also means um, that when you do it, you have to do it and do not much else. <laughs> so yeah. that, I'm, hoping, <laughs> I'm hoping for that to happen only three years from now. <laughs> yeah, no, I think um, one of the things we're doing, updating these kind of books is getting more students involved in the commenting on things so that um, at least you have some student feedback on it. But again, if you don't agree with the student, there's a tendency to kind of go, okay, um, you know, nice comment, but um, I, you know, I'm sure we're all guilty of that in other ways as well. Um, Annika, there's a question about inequality in performance. So are lots of these things, your projects, um, you know, interactive activities, things like that, really engaged by the best students and are the weaker students, is there a risk of them being left even further behind? So do you think it increases inequality or helps maybe? Um, I'm not going to say everybody engages with it in the same way, of course they don't. Um, we don't let students choose their groups and the groups changed for every project. So, you know, everybody stayed within the same class, but the, the whole class would shift around the groups that they were actually doing the project in. And in that sense, I think it actually gave me a better chance as a cheater of class to notice more and have more contact with people who, who appear to be struggling um, and more opportunities to encourage them to find a meaningful way to participate in the group whether it's making the slides or doing the reference list or uploading the thing or, you know, checking it against the, the checklist at the end. Um, so I, I think in that sense, it probably helped the students, the, the, the weaker students more than if we hadn't done it. I'm gonna say it's really, really hard to measure because I'm not quite sure what the counterfactual would be in the, from that period in time. Um, but as, as a tutor, it felt like, I understood well what was going on with each of the students. They almost created check-ins. Yeah. And not just check-ins where they could just sit at the back of the class and not do anything either, because you're having so many of these small group conversations and there's only four people in the group. You're going to ask, you've got the opportunity to ask a question to each person and see how they're responding. Um, most of the time, it wasn't really an issue with people being like weaker academically, but it gave you more opportunity to notice students who actually just weren't engaging with any material from any unit as much as they should yeah. be because of the type of thing they were saying. And um, Jadrian, or anything to add to that? Do you think this way of teaching affects different students different ways? It does. Um, it's just it's figuring out how to get the students engaged who were coming in unengaged from day one. Um, so for at least at Penn State, you know, it's a lot of first year students. So Anna commissioned it like a long time ago. You know, they come in wanting to learn a certain thing, especially like I teach principles of micro. Uh, so they come in when they hear economics wanting to learn macro. Uh, they And they kind of from day one, they're not getting what they wanted. Um, and so that's a really big challenge of just knowing that they're not interested on day one. Um, and so if I can bring in different people in different areas of starting the very first class talking about how we'll answer big questions, uh, and I give them examples of big questions that we've answered, and, you know, just kind of reframing stuff away from how a traditional textbook does it um, is, has been really helpful. So I, I think these approaches do help, and it's, it's not losing the people who are already engaged. Uh, the people who are already engaged are engaged in all of it. They, it's just more stuff for them. It's bringing in those people who who didn't like what we were doing before. Yeah, and I think um, as somebody who, who used to always blame herself for anything, you know, if, if you saw a bigger gap or more fails or something like that, oh, that's because of how I teach. Mm -hmm. I think having some faith in what Doug's put in about the sort of, there is research in, out there about active learning helping, about group work helping. So if one year, it, you know, there may be cohort effects rather than it being about how you're teaching. So I think it's important that people don't knee jerk out of something. Um, just be, and, you know, you'll always have students who like it and students who don't. And I think, you know, whatever way you're teaching. So, it's, you know, have some confidence, but also I think Doug's just reminded me, you know, if you've researched how you're teaching and what you're teaching and, you you know, you've all spent a huge amount of time on this stuff. Um, because it's a labor of love. 
um, then I think, you know, do have faith in yourselves a little bit. Um, an important thing there, though, I think, is if you're teaching with a big tutor team, is you have to make sure you create a lot of time to explain to the other tutors why you're doing it. And I don't know, I'm sure there's lots of people out there like, you know, I, I have tutors on my team all the way from like, you know, professor to, to, to teaching associate, and they, they come at it from very different angles. Um, and sort of ensuring that the, the, the people who are newer to the profession know how to get people to work in groups, because we all know it doesn't work magically. You just stand at the front of the room and say, work in groups now, and they, they, they won't, and they kind of lack the skills. But at the same time, trying to convince the more senior people in the profession that this is worth spending time on getting them to do it. Um, I found that in a lot of the stuff I've had to do, I've had to really write down, if you're not sure what to do or why we're doing it, here's the teaching suggestion for this material that we've given you. The, um, so Arjun, have you come across any pushback or raised eyebrows from colleagues for moving away from traditional materials and traditional textbooks at all? Um, not really. I mean, that's because we started really with this. We were fortunate that we said we would start with this. If anything, I've got pushed back that um, this is not as radical as it should be. And that's another mm -hmm. sort of, uh, um, you know, approach, both both pedagogically and, and in terms of content. But that's, you know, you're not going to please uh, everyone on this. Some of my colleagues have used the core material and actually been pedagogically quite innovative you know, the experiments and the, the group games and so on. So it's possible to do that. I myself have been much more, the kind of word is traditional, uh, the less kind of word is probably unadventurous and stuck in the mud and more used to chalk and talk as a word. Uh, but I can see how it's really valuable. All of these, these you know, the different set of approaches are much, much more engaging for them. Uh, yeah, that's, that's generally been my experience. And Jadrian, how about you? Have you had any raised eyebrows to teaching with multimedia instead of some very nice intro to principles course textbook? Yeah, I get, I, I say I get challenges from two sides. I get it from both students and faculty. Um, and I think a lot of times faculty, when they hear about media in the classroom, just assume that there's no assessments behind it, that it's just for fun and that it's, you know, play a clip and then keep going. Um, a lot of times it's, it's recognizing like there are like, they are constantly being quizzed questions uh, during class. Like I'm, I'm asking them regularly uh, about stuff. And I could just ask them a, re a regular kind of textbook multiple choice question, or I could show them a 30 second clip and then ask them a question, an application question. And so I try to explain, at least to my colleagues that are questioning it, you know, I'm, I'm working on higher order types questions. Like I could ask them a definition or I can ask them to apply the material. Uh, and so I think a lot of times once people actually see the types of questions and see what's happening, then they're less challenging on it. Um, I do have issues with students even, um, just because it is different than all their other classes. So a lot of their other courses, if they're not using active learning in other courses, or if they didn't come from a high school that had a lot of it, um, or if they're not using media, you know, uh, some of them do just want, tell me what I need to know, tell me what's on the test, and then let me take the test. Yeah. Um, and you know, there, there's going to be faculty that never agree with me. There's going to be students that never agree with me. Um, and and they're, they're just not, I'm just not going to please them. Um, and so sometimes I need to get student buy-in too, and that, that can be a challenge. And um, Annika, um, there's a question from Doug about how you train your teaching associates. So I guess the more junior people involved. Um, but also if you have anything to say on any other pushback or eyebrows raised that you get from colleagues. Oh, um, dramatically. <laughs> <laughs> Let me take the training question first. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess the, the University of Bristol's makeup's a little bit different to other places I've been, particularly in London. It always felt like we had a lot of sort of PhD students on hand to act as teaching associates. Bristol's not quite the same. Um, so you have a lot of people at all levels um, involved in even small group class teaching. Um, and that means you can end up running a unit with this very diverse cohort of, uh, of tutors. Um, and as the courses, the sizes have grown, you know, um, you know all, all our teaching associates come in, you know, are required to do as you are in many UK institutions, um, qualifications for the Fellowship of the Higher Education Academy, the FHEA status. Um, we'll typically go through the economic network training of, of GTA classes or early careers workshops. Um, 
And so we'll get some general training like that. Um, but I'm very aware that my course is the, the, the introductory economics course. And so it's where students are going to spend a lot of their time in the first year. And I'm really keen that it goes right um, and that students make good, positive professional relationships with the people who are teaching them and that they learn how to be university students. Um, and I noticed that when I had a really big class, as uh, so a really big team of tutors, that sometimes that, that wasn't working out. So I guess the way I do it now is, as I said before, for every set of work I create for a class, set of questions and so on, I try wherever possible to create a sort of teaching plan alongside that um, and say, if you don't know how to deliver this, this is probably what I'm going to do. Um, and when I've created my own stuff for my own class, like a few extra slides or something like that as well, I will also share that so that people can sort of see what I meant by the questions I put down on the paper. Um, I try to have really friendly peer observations. Um, we have official peer observations that go you know, alongside contracts. Um, but along with another colleague, Stefania Simeon, we, we've tried to have a sort of much more low key mentoring program as well, where people can talk through the problems that they're having, because I think this active learning stuff is very new to some people, depending on the type of system they've come from and we kind of drop them in it. So I guess, yeah, my, my, my approach to training isn't really to set up a formal training scheme. It's to repeatedly say, here's what I'd like you to do. Here's how I'm going to try and do it. You're welcome to reinterpret that. Um, and why don't we keep talking about it and keep, keep observing each other so that we can kind of continue this conversation. And do you get any pushback from the teaching assistants on doing active learning? Do you find some of them just do? Uh, so some of them will try and make it more traditional. Um, yes, we have conversations about why not to. I'd say in terms of the projects I actually presented earlier, the, the pushback would more typically come from the content. Um, depending on how you've been through university yourself, I think sometimes we're not very well equipped as economists to deal with a lot of the big questions that the you know, current world is throwing up. Um, you know, questions on racial inequality, for example, lots of people don't necessarily feel able to answer those questions in front of a class in a way that's going to satisfy the class and, and them. Um, and that was, I think, where we had more heated conversations within the tutor group as to what questions should be and how they were going to deal with it. Um, and that's where a lot of the things I said earlier about making sure the questions are open enough that students can find their own way through to a question that they're happy tackling for a long period of time came from. Um, it's yeah. kind of just striking me, so Jadrian's point about teach what you know, but actually as a teaching assistant, you don't get to do that. You get you get told what to teach. So it does create um, challenges for teaching assistants, I think, but I guess <laughs> if it's open enough, then they can frame it. They've got to be comfortable or, or the class isn't going to work. So yeah. I, I feel like with students really, you've got to keep talking to them. <laughs> And doing that. Yeah, I think regular check ins is important. I do that when you have teams of TAs. I think the, your approach of, you know, if there's somebody who did it before mentoring new people and people talking to each other is quite a nice idea, as well as the um, observation, friendly observations, um, is quite a nice idea. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes. If anybody has any more questions, that you can put them in the QA. But what I'm going to do is just ask each of you um, if someone like me or any of the hundred or so people in the audience were thinking about diversifying their teaching material and resources, maybe in similar ways to you, but maybe just, I think I need to change my resources. Um, what would you recommend they do to get started? Um, Arjun, do you want to start? Sure. I mean, uh, I speak of my experience, I think, thinking about what um, what they want students to actually learn can be a good start, right? I mean, not not um, take what the book says and try to try to find different resources. That's, that's clearly one way to go about it, but there may be certain other things. And it's a much harder and maybe um, slower process, but materials will come up if you start with that. And uh, I'm really really impressed by the amount of things that people are doing across the world, including this in this conference, in, to try to bring in things from the real world very soon, you know, to, to, to bear in the classroom. So, 
I would say that's the place to start. That's a very good starting point. Annika, what would your advice be? Um, it sounds obvious, but keep speaking to your students. Um, yeah, I, th I think that that low key feedback on a weekly basis, just of how are things going? What do you like? What do you not like? It's a lot more useful to me than end of year feedback and formal feedback forms. I think things I've seen other colleagues do recently that I would probably want to explore and I think is a good idea is, is, is finding well-run focused groups. People who understand the teaching process, people who understand a little bit about economics, having more in-depth conversations with them about what they're learning and what they think they're learning. Um, I think I've seen yield some really, really interesting results. Um, and so, yeah, whatever resources available you, you have available to you, I, th I think speaking and listening to your students um, before reacting is, is, is a really important stage. Thank you. Adrian? Uh, so one of the things that I think, it took me a couple of years to, to realize it, um, but I've gotten much better like since I've figured it out, is that um, students are students want to know about you as a person and the things that you're interested in. Um, and so I, I think it connects a little bit of Arjun's and Annika's comments of like, you know, what do you want them to get out of it? Um, sharing that with them, like just telling them, I want you to learn this. Uh, a lot of times I think we keep that information to ourselves for some reason, or like we hide it because we think we're giving away exam questions or something. <laughs> um, just even sharing things like, like, you know, where, where you went on vacation. Like, you know, I went on vacation and I saw this. They are fascinated that we are humans, that we are, watch the news and we go on vacation and we eat dinners places. Um, you know, I've started to just use examples from, from around town of just like, you know, I went here last week and students just, they want to know like, what'd you get? What do you eat there? What do you eat at this one place? Um, and so it's, I, I would say be comfortable. If you're, if you're comfortable sharing that, I know some people aren't, but if you're comfortable sharing that, like they are actually very interested in those things. Um, they're interested in the thing, like the movies that I watch, the books that I read, the places that I visit for vacations. Um, it, it's, I would say, be be comfortable sharing that information if it's something that you are really passionate about. So if it's topics that you're passionate about, if it's stories, if it's questions you want the answer to, um, the, the students like hearing those things. So I think the bring yourself to work message um, is quite a good one to remember as well in there. I just remembered I had some slides to share, which I will do now um, before I say thank you to you. So our next session is on increasing diversity in economics, which obviously connects to this, um, which will be um, chaired by Sylvia Del Bianco. So we will have a five minutes-ish comfort break for you. Um, and then as Prama has just put in the chat, we have our um, networking mixer sponsored by Ed. A discussion who are our first group um which starts at 6 p.m london time five hours earlier in the east states and somewhere where arjun's asleep i'm hoping at that point um i just want to say a huge thank you to our panelists it's been a really engaging discussion um i've learned a lot i'm sure everyone else has it's probably a good opportunity to remind people that we will pick up the questions and anything from the chat that we think is relevant and kind of summarize it. There'll be blogs coming out written by students about the sessions. Um, so do keep an eye on our website and Twitter and all other places. And obviously the session will be on YouTube as well if you want to share it with any of your colleagues afterwards. Um, so we are going to end this session with a huge thank you um, and hopefully see you in the next one.